Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Royal College of Pathologists webinar on implementation of the new guideline program. My name is Peter Johnston. I'm one of the vice presidents um, of the Royal College, and I'm really pleased to be here hosting this webinar today. And we've got some leading experts in the field who are going to talk to you about the tissue pathways of non-neoplastic neuropathology specimens. And we hope we'll be able to clarify some of the questions and issues that have been brought up around the new guideline, which we're just implementing. I'd like, first of all, to introduce the, the, the panel for today. The first is the speaker, Professor Sebastian Brander, who is the lead author of um, the guidelines. The co-authors are Dr. Monica Hofer, Dr. Zani Yukama, y y <laughs> I got this right earlier, sorry Zani, Zani Yuan Mukantney and Professor Maria Tom. And they were all here to respond to your questions as we go on. Questions you can ask um, live as we go through the question and answer function, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen mark Q&A and you can key in a question there. So the presentation will last approximately 15 minutes and then it will be followed by a 20 minute question and answer sessions. We hope we'll be able to cover all the questions in that time, but should not that be possible, we'll be able to follow them up later on if needs be. So without any further ado, um, I would like to start off by wel welcoming our speaker, Sebastian uh, Brander, and thank you all very much for coming. Yeah. Uh Hello and welcome uh, to this uh, webinar on the implementation guidance for non-neoplastic neuropathology specimens. I'm Sebastian Brandner, Professor of Neuropathology, and uh, here you can see the co-authors uh, on the uh, guideline. Today we will um, uh, follow the following objectives. First of all, it is a main objective to understand common obstacles uh, in um, the implementation of the tissue pathways and to provide a starting point to circumvent common barriers to the implementation and the outcome for you should be an available toolkit for practice review and importantly an identification of easy wins for implementation of these pathways but also identify areas to outsource consolidate network and collaborate the neuropathology tissue pathways consist of multiple different aspects of specialist neuropathology reporting. We will cover today muscle biopsy, peripheral nerve biopsy, small fiber neuropathy, skin biopsies, epilepsy, and surgical non-neoplastic tissue. And in the yellow color, you see the panelists who will be available for uh, answering the questions on these uh, subjects. There are further topics like CSF, temporal artery. There are no specific challenges identified, so we will not cover with them. Cover them. And also hair, urine sample preparation is extremely rare. And please refer to the pathway document, how to refer these samples to specialist centers. Um, the key challenges in muscle biopsy preparation uh, is a time interval from the tissue retrieval to freezing a laboratory. For mitochondrial enzyme, this should be ideally immediately within minutes. For tinctorial and immunostainings, two hours, ideally even shorter for enzyme histochemistry. It requires high quality muscle biopsy technical expertise and laboratory support, it's well trained staff. Uh, the, the processing workup is technically challenging and the board should participate in external quality assurances schemes. Uh, what about the tissue preparation? The snap frozen tissue should take in priority over everything else. Uh, formula fixation is not a priority and may not be required at all. If there is surfix, a surplus material, then you can fix it. And this can be used for vasculitic and inflammatory marker workup. The frozen tissue is also essential for the recruitment into genomic studies and the functional characterization of these, uh, of these uh, muscle biopsies. In terms of reporting, we see uh, the biggest obstacles in uh, obtaining high quality clinical information. So it's important to obtain a, a good summary of the clinical presentation, exam findings, uh, laboratory findings, imaging findings. We suggest to have an specific muscle biopsy request form with all the relevant prompts. 
In terms of stainings, we don't want to go into great detail. Please look at our re guidelines recommendations, but just to highlight that myosin immunostaining should be introduced as the HPases, which are shown here on the right-hand side, may not be longer included in the next uh, revision of these guidelines. In terms of post-diagnostic post uh, workup, it's really important having routine um, multidisciplinary clinical pathology reviews, having a good relationship uh, with the clinical teams to support a tailored and timely uh, patient management. Next, a number of the tests are extremely specialized. So consider referring nationally to specialist services, super regional referrals networks. And they also change is expecting with the reorganization of the genome laboratory hubs. So we're going to have in England seven of those hubs, which are equipped to do um, uh, all the genomic analysis of uh, complex diseases. The next challenging area in these uh, guidelines are the nerve biopsies. Let's look at the infrastructure, what is required. First of all, the preparation of high quality semithin section is an obstacle because it's low volume. There are often staff training issues. There are issues with validation, accreditation. The solution that we recommend is formation of a competence center and the referral network. Teased fibers of high quality, again, it's challenging to due to the very low volume and frequency, they're often staff training issues, the solution. Um, these uh, teased fibers sit in fixative and glutaldehyde that allows long-term uh, long storage, and their sample sharing is a possibility. And then another relatively um, uh, problematic area is the access to diagnostic electromicroscopy facilities. These are expensive. They're being closed down uh, across the country. Uh, there's a lack of training. Uh, there's also a lack of pro a prospect of career development for, uh, for the uh, technical staff. Um, often tests are replaced by genetic testing. Preparation of the sample, again, staff issues. EM scanning requires high quality facilities, which are really expensive to maintain. The solution is to maintain a smaller number of high quality centers that are accredited to pool expertise and to pool sample analysis. The technical aspects of a nerve biopsy are external factors, so there can be difficult to influence. That is often surgical artifacts, requires good communication with surgical teams, adequate length of biopsy. Please have a look at the guidelines, what is recommended, and it's really important that this is followed. And the choice of a biopsy site is equally important. Internal factors so within the pathology department, this can be easier addressed. It's important to adhere to the guidelines regarding embedding with transverse and longitudinal section. Focus on consistent laboratory staining fixative uh, fixation protocols. And what we also recommend and follow the guidelines, try to replace inconsistent tinctorial stains such as silver stains, uh, uh, it looks so fast blue. Um, with neurofilament or myelin basic protein. So try to uh, use immunostaining where possible. The next topic, again, another challenge. It's a skin biopsy for the diagnosis of small fiber neuropathies. The preparation, the fixation and transport uh, to laboratory requires a very specific fixative, should be pre prepared freshly and delivered uh, to users. We recommend setting up a local pathway where the material is immediately fixed and then shipped to a nearby laboratory. Uh, another choice that has to be made, whether it's bright field, immunostaining, or immunofluorescence for the analysis. So that's the transport and fixation. Then the technical aspect, cutting thick cryosection. This is a floating technique, it's challenging, and it requires a lot of biomedical uh, expertise. And the staining, there are standard protocols and the technique is well established, but it really requires a widespread sharing of established protocols from elsewhere. The diagnosis and reporting of the skin, fiber, skin uh, biopsies for small fiber neuropathies, it requires a lot of training to count them accurately and they are benchmarked against um, um, individuals that are already trained in this technique. And it is manually counted, it's very time consuming, 
It's challenging in the context of consultant staffing shortages and automated counting software is not easily available. And uh, it's important that, that a clinical pathological correlation is discussed with the clinical teams. It's recommended to leave this to the clinical teams, provide counts only together with a reference table. Interlaboratory comparisons are currently challenging. Um, they are required, but there's no national scheme currently available. The next topic are epilepsy, surgical resection, non-neoplastic. So the technical aspects first, the macroscopic orientation of the sample and fragmented specimen can be a significant challenge. Uh, often these are multi-region samples. The surgical team must label distinct regions like gyros on electrode. It must provide an orientation marker to correlate with EEG and it needs to collect and discuss in person. So a communication with a surgical team is really important also for epilepsy lobes. The specific regions need to be documented once in the pathology department, photography and ink markers. And there should be, um, one should follow published guidance to cut up lobectomies and follow the anatomical landmarks. An important question, how much tissue to sample in large resections? We recommend that all tissue is blocked in large multi-block resections. The mega blocks, so anything exceeding the standard cassette size is less uh, commonly used. It, one could argue it's less recommended simply because it is incompatible with the workflow in most laboratories, considering the, the widespread use of automated staining processes such as the, the major manufacturers, they all uh, process just standard slides. So divide into smaller blocks and document this in a report. Frozen diagnostic archive, the freezing and banking of tissue is important. And should there be the rare scenario that the formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue is not fully representative of the lesion, there's always an option going back to the frozen material, put it into formalin, fix it and process as usual. That is still a very high quality um, achievable. Thick sections are required for certain uh, aspects such as cortical architecture. They require technical skills. Again, it's a training issue. Diagnostic challenges. Um, working with fragmented specimens. This includes um, surgical aspirate, fragmented surgical aspirate, CUSA samples. For example, new N and Luxul fast blue to identify hippocampal, amygdala subfields and try to aggregate pathology feature for the hippocampal sclerosis subtypes. Another issue could be prior invasive recordings in the, whilst the uh, lobe was in C2. So a great proportion of cases have previous depth electrodes or even grids and check that with clinical records, liaise with the surgical team. If not known, it can be misinterpreted as primary neuroinflammatory process. A reactive astrocyte around electrode can simulate balloon cells. Lack of specific markers due to infrequent use in the laboratory. Please have a look at our pathway document for further guidance, which markers are considered essential and uh, um, mandatory or nice to have or useful to have. Access to genetic tests for somatic mutation. This has got a lot better through the availability and access to our genome laboratory hubs that provide an extensive range of uh, next generation sequencing panels. Um, there can be a complex or subjective pathology, focal cortical dysplasia, mild malformations, or lack of concordance with neuroimaging. MDT discussion, as always, and specialist opinion. There's in the UK, we have the EPICAR network, which can, uh, can be consulted for, for second opinion. Finally, last topic, diagnostic brain biopsies, technical aspects. First, the added external factors. Again, requires engagement and discussion with surgeons and pathway coordinators. For diagnostic brain biopsies, so non-neoplastic in, in most instances, adequate size of sample, important to include meninges, gray matter, and white matter. The choice of the biopsy site to capture the relevant pathology, really important. Discuss that at MDT prior to surgery with the presence of a pathologist. Prepare the laboratory for sample arrival. Ensure the sample is fre sent fresh during working hours to allow an adequate workup. 
And then we come to the internal factors once it's submitted, and this can be addressed from within pathology. The sample cut up, frozen archiving, Western blotting, next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing. This certainly facilitates these tests. Optional glutaldehyde for electron microscopy, but arguably this loses or uh, there is probably a, a decreasing significance of that. Prion disease suspect uh, cases, we recommend subdivision into three portions as all described in the pathway document, the stepwise approach. So first sample formalin and formic acid treatment, and then the FFPE for initial exclusion of prion disease. Second, uh, second sample formalin without formic acid, once this has been excluded for routine histology, CD markers uh, and uh, any other markers. And the third bit should be frozen archived for um, uh, either PCR tests, uh, virus tests, or for Western blotting. When level sections are considered, keep all sections between individual levels. And adequate sample orientation is really important to assess cortical cytokine architecture, leptomeninges, and white matter. The diagnostic aspects, often a limitation is the choice, uh, the, the limited choice in laboratories or neurodegeneration markers, viral markers. The interpretation of pathology finding requires a good knowledge of pathological changes associated with inflammatory and neurodegenerative diseases, including prion disease, knowledge of possible genetic and iatrogenic causes of amyloid beta pathology, and other hallmark pathological features associated with a genetic neurodegenerative disease. If necessary, refer for further immunostochemical characterization for any type of misfolded protein uh, related neurodegenerative disease if not possible locally. And that ends the presentation. It's now open for question. Thank you very much. Sebastian, thank you very much indeed. That was a, a beautifully presented and very clear uh, run through the guidelines. As Sebastian said, the, the, the panel is available for questions. And what I'd like to do is to start off with a couple of questions about muscle biopsies, which have been submitted one online and one before. The first question which has just been asked live is um, this respondent is interested to inquire as to why ATPases are being removed from the, the usual set of investigations. Yeah, very good question. I would like to pass on to Monica. They're not yet removed. It's a little bit of a heads up for you, but it is really felt that the immun immunohistochemistry, the fast and slow myosins allow very good characterization. And also it's much easier to detect what we call co-expression of fast and slow myosins, which is a, quite an important feature of abnormality. So uh, that cannot be done with ATPases. Also ATPases, they're technically they're more of a, um, you know, not an immunostain, perhaps less available. So they're still in the current guideline. It's just to give you a heads up as we move on, if you haven't got the immunohistochemical, the, the myosin stains, if you could introduce them because the others will be removed. That's the prediction. Perhaps a comment uh, uh, from in terms of laboratory optimization and uh, how to get a buy-in from lab managers. Arguably, this could be a cost saving because the ATPases is very manual. It's a very, uh, it's a very complicated uh, comparatively to uh, staining a muscle section on uh, on an automated uh, immunostainer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers the question. Just staying on muscle, if I may, there, there is a question about developing the best strategies for handling muscle biopsies in DGHs. Uh, and increasingly with the specialization of particularly neuropathology services in one or two places at some distance, I think the delivery of the service um, away from the centers is becoming increasingly important. How, how, what, are your, what, would you, what would your strategies be around um, dealing with muscle biopsies at a distance? Yeah, so uh, district general hospitals generally don't have the laboratory muscle biopsies uh, technical support uh, available. They don't have by, uh, trained biomedical scientists who can do the freezing and the staining. So in that sense, um, 
unless there are exceptions, it would be important to uh, find out as part of the pathway uh, creation, where is the nearest center and how quickly can it be reached? So if it can be reached in less than two hours, then, then that may be okay for uh, query inflammatory myositides. So we have a few uh, of, of those pathways in our region. But if it's a query mitochondrial patient, then it's actually better to have the patient refer to the uh, specialist neuromuscular center and have the whole package delivered at the specialist neuromuscular center. That would be my um, view on that. And that's certainly how, how, how many centers handle this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for that. I think um, the, we don't have any more live questions um, on, on the go just now. So those of you who are watching, if you've got any points, please do bring them up. We have had some submit, submitted questions and a number of them are to do with infectious disease, particularly tuberculosis. Um, I just wonder, um, it, the, the, the questions are about handling tuberculomas and the protocol for dealing with tuberculosis. Um, my understanding is that, you know, we need, well, as, as in all laboratory specimens that arrive fresh, we need to take specific precautions around some um, just interested in your comments around around those yeah. points. I could comment on that uh, as part of our accreditation, but also the general health and safety aspects in our laboratory. Essentially, every single biopsy, in particular diagnostic biopsies, they are treated as potential high risk. We do not, in our workflow, specifically discriminate low risk from high risk from a logical aspect, because we don't actually know the risk of any single incoming sample. So we treat as a, as a whole uh, uh, processing, uh, 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 as a, a tissue process, uh, everything is potentially high risk. So adequate uh, PPE, adequate uh, cut up areas, ventilation, etc. There are, however, specific guidelines how to deal with tuberculosis and they are written in our pathway document. Should the uh, those who have the specific question want to have more clarity, they can also raise that as a general issue and we can incorporate them in future guidelines. Tuberculosis is not a particular health concern in the United Kingdom. Those guidelines were written for the United Kingdom. However, we are very happy to consider that in subsequent revisions to make it a bit more um, universally applicable. Thank you. Um, we have... Um, we We've seen quite a lot of interest in muscle biopsies today. So I'm going to come back with more um, muscles, um, Monica. The first one is um, about a dividing or separating type 2B fiber atrophy from degeneration. And um, the key, you know, it's an important question, but the question is, do you believe immuno is better for this? So that is, you know, that is quite specific and that is an area where, you, you know, the ATPA says that is one of their strengths. But, um, you know, overall, it, it's not that many situations where perhaps you might need to do that. But yes, it is, you know, nothing is perfect, but, and, you know, one has to decide why one keeps one thing going on and not another. What I would say is that there are uh, antibodies being developed and tested that might address this in the future. And that might link in with us going to recommend dropping the ATPases and an antibody becoming available. So there's research work out there that some of my colleagues are doing that may become available on that front. And that's the direction of travel, I would say, with that yeah. question. Mm -hmm. do, do, you think, um, do you think that you know, we will move towards a, a, a larger immunocytochemistry panel because there's another question in here about asking for the role of TDP43 um, in inflammatory muscle biopsies uh, in addition. So do you, do you think that's a direction of travel? So um, not specifically the TDP43 in the diagnostic setting, certainly the P62 as a marker to pick up uh, protein aggregates as a screen. So uh, quite a few laboratories, you know, the, this is guidance, but there are quite a few laboratories and that now includes ours that use uh, P62 as part of their initial screen for muscle biopsies precisely to pick that up. But I think TDP43 is perhaps a little bit more specific, uh, not, uh, you know, th that's perhaps quite specific, I would say. So P62 in the general diagnostic setting, I think would be more valuable. Okay, there are also questions about myosin heavy chain antibodies and routine muscle biopsy. 
do you do you include them on a panel? No, not currently, no. Mm -hmm. But as I say, there, there is room for development in that area. It's also people interested in, in type 2C fibers as well, that in the pediatric setting can be of interest. It's quite a specialist area, it has to be said. But one has to you know, uh, decide how much can one offer in a standard diagnostic setting and how much interlink with research. And one neuromuscular center might specialize in one area where others might do others. But it, it, I think it's the direction of trouble to having more immunohistochemical, immunohistochemical stains rather than fewer. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> another question, a slight change of, of um, tack here. Th this one has uh, come in uh, and it's, it's about focal cortical dysplasia. <clears throat> it's a technical question round about how do you report focal cortical dysplasia in fragmented specimens. Sebastian mentioned that many specimens coming in from, well, from all sorts of surgery nowadays come um, as if they've been through a mincer. Um, <clears throat> and that, that does present many of us with difficulties. Um, what would your approach be to this panel? I don't know who would like to cope with that. That is one. Maria's domain. She is specialist in epilepsy reporting. You need to unmute. Sorry, Maria, you're muted. So he hello, hi. Um, so yes, this is a problem most of us will encounter is that um, y you sometimes provide it with a CUSA specimen and obviously it depends on the operative procedure. I, I think first of all, um, if, this is, if this is recurring that all your epilepsy specimens are coming as CUSA, first of all, a dialogue, dialogue with your neurosurgeon, I would really recommend that because Cortical dysplasia is by definition are cortical. So there may be a rationale, why can't they take out a, a, a cortical resection, a lesionectomy? So have this dialogue, first of all, with the surgical approach, because if, you're, if you are trying to make a diagnosis of cortical dysplasia, obviously it's really compromised if, you're, if your specimen is fragmented, because you really need to look at the cortical architecture. But nevertheless, if all you have, and, and, and sometimes the abnormal cells are only in the CUSA and they're not in your main lesion because there's a very localized um, abnormality, you're very much reliant on doing special stains. And in, as in the um, outline, just to do the neurofilament stains, the new end, to pick up these abnormal size neurons, always be aware of what the cortical site is. The Brogman area is really important because neurons vary in size according to cortical region. But doing those stains can give you a um, and then if, you've, if you're lucky to have the mTOR pathway and antibodies, just to look at these abnormal cells. Uh, and then if you're still left with a differential, you're not sure if it's an FCD, if these neurons are part of an FCD or is a tumor such as a ganglioglioma in the differential, then you have to think about maybe doing molecular analysis for that just to exclude a tumor. So all these steps you take. But I think the first thing, if you're repeatedly getting CUSA samples to assess FCD, just take these steps um, to talk to your surgeon and say in a full thickness cortical biopsy it is really recommended to, if you want to evaluate this pathology. And then of course, you know, always with the, when you've got the diagnosis, always communicate with your surgical team and your epileptologist, does this match with the MRI, what you're seeing on the preoperative scans to sort of put it together. But yeah, it can be frustrating. Um, it is possible to make a diagnosis of SCG type two on a CUSA, but it's not, you know, it's not the optimal way to, to go about the diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Just on the subject of, of epilepsy, um, there's a, a question asking, could we have some more details about the Epicare network for epilepsy specimens, please? Yeah, so epilepsy surgery is it's not, there aren't many centers in the UK that do a lot of it. So there's a European network that has been set up and that's run by in, in Erlangen. So there is a possibility to I mean, I occasionally send samples there that are difficult. Um, and so you get, a, a, it's just like getting a, a sort of a, a, a further opinion. Yeah, but if you're in the, it depends. Um, so European uh, centers will use that network. Um, but if you're not in Europe, there may be other, other, other networks available. So it's just finding, if you don't get many epilepsy cases, um, and you're uncomfortable or you want further opinion and I completely understand that it's best as if you're in the UK to find a neuropathologist who who does a lot that um, uh, and to link up locally and then if it's still a difficult case and it needs 
further work up genetics, then think of EpiCare um, uh, as a further opinion. Um, yeah, but I could, I could send information on that, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious that Yanni is sitting there, no one's asked a question so, uh, about nerves. So I was going to ask a question just because, um, again, fr from a, a center which is peripheral to the main neuropathology site, um, the preparation of or the maintenance of the integrity of nerve samples for um, transport on, how would you recommend that we should go about doing that? Um. Sander, would you like to answer this? Yes. Uh, can I just clarify? You mean transportation from the surgical theater to the labor laboratory? Or? Well, for, from surgical theater to the laboratory and then from the laboratory on to, I mean, uh, if, if you look at my situation, I'm in Aberdeen and the neuropathology center is in Edinburgh, 126 miles away. How, how do we organize that for safe onward transportation to yeah. make sure that neuropathology gets a specimen in its optimum condition? Mm -hmm. So, uh, a couple of elements there. So one of the elements is that for optimal interpretation of the nerve biopsy, just the background, we really would like to have the tissue fixed in uh, formalin for paraffin histology and the other part of the specimen fixed in glutar aldehyde for the resin uh, examine resin section preparations and then electron microscopy can be performed on that. And because it's really just two fixatives, formalin fixative and glutar aldehyde, in which we want the samples separately to be fixed in, these fixatives can in a room temperature be delivered those hundred miles apart to the place where the surgery takes place and that the nerve biopsies are put in these fixatives and then in a no rushed manner transferred to the center where they will be analyzed. So rather than, in contrast to muscle, for example, rather than rushing the fresh tissue through all that long distance, actually sending the, these uh, fluids, homolin and glutaraldehyde, to the theaters that the uh, material is fixed straight away there. And then, as I say, they can be in room temperature delivered to the laboratory and examined uh, accordingly. So the third uh, element is also, which is always sort of question whether the nerve biopsy needs to be also prepared uh, frozen, whether the frozen tissue is required. So the answer to that is it's not required for diagnostic purposes. Frozen tissue is really only needed if one is considering any downstream genetic analysis or research studies on the frozen tissue. For the diagnostic purposes, frozen nerve biopsy is not adding any additional value. If anything, uh, the immunohistochemistry is less of less of quality of, and therefore the paraffin histology can actually provide for nerve biopsy the interpretation uh, much more accurate. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. That's very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> are there any other questions? I, I do have one or two others that came in earlier. Um, however, I'm not exactly sure how to ask them because they, they are single words and I don't really know how to translate that into a question. Um, so if there's nothing else coming in. Ah, here we are. Thank you very much. What is the best modality to see virus induced changes in muscle biopsies during the times of COVID-19 in particular? And that does actually fit with one of the questions we just said viral infections, but I don't know, the context here is perhaps more specific and answerable. The virus induced muscle biopsy changes, that is, um, I would say a challenging area. Uh, COVID-19, I personally don't have first-hand experience with that in muscle. And I think there's still, you know, uh, it's relatively little out there as, as to, you know, question about direct involvement of muscle, etc. But secondary changes one could see. Uh, primary viral type um, involvement. Um, I personally rely heavily on the clinical information there and microbiology testing as well, because that can sometimes clinch the diagnosis in these cases. I have seen, um, uh, you know, uh, the situation where uh, immunohistochemistry has been performed on muscle, checking for, you know, there are certain antigens you can test for, uh, herpes simplex, varicella, various others. Uh, the interpretation can be 
a bit challenging. So I think the clinical part, the clinical context and microbiology context there is very important. I think it's not an easy area. Thank you. I mean, it does raise an interesting possibility um, because <clears throat> I've certainly seen a, a brain biopsy, which someone asked me to look at in case it was a lymphoma. And that led us on to the notion of whether COVID-19 was involved um, in, in the production of this interesting uh, almost demyelinating lesion in a young woman. I just wonder if, if um, as this is about non-neoplastic neuropathology specimens, I wonder if someone would like to just have a very brief summary of the sort of changes we have been seeing in neuropathology um, in COVID-19. Uh, I could answer that very briefly uh, by saying Zan and I and Maria, actually the three of us, we have published a co-authored a paper not long ago, and perhaps Sana can summarize the key findings uh, in, these, in this autopsy study. Yeah, so uh, the, the summary is that the findings are complex. I, I think that the sort of the greatest unifying feature between all the reported cases of COVID-19 infection affecting the brain is that it is causing ischemic uh, damage and the mechanisms, how that ischemia is caused, that's a, a pretty much a discussion on its own, a very lengthy discussion. Putting that ischemic da damage aside and evidence sort of, of also microvascular injury with micro hemorrhages, micro uh, ischemic uh, perivascular lesions. There are also reported evidence, Maria has had a case where the COVID-19 infection is more acting as it is inducing immune-mediated reaction in brain. And then everything we know about immune-mediated encephalopathies can be seen in the brain. For example, in the spectrum of ADEM, perivascular demyelinating lesion, something similar to what, what you described. Um, so yeah, direct infection, uh, ischemia related to the lung, uh, dysfun lung uh, function dysfunction, and then immune-mediated changes in the spe spectrum of in inflammatory demyelinating uh, process. But, but it is very complex. I think for the years to come, we probably will still learn the, the variety of the changes that COVID-19 has caused. And yeah, many, many more to follow. Um, <clears throat> we have a question come in about um, metachromatic leukodystrophy. And, and the question is, if there is a suspicion of metachromatic leukodystrophy, how do you send a fresh nerve to neuropathology from a far center? Perhaps uh, uh, one could answer this, that there is obviously, there's a genetic defect. And the genetic defect is something they should have obviously examined with genetic testing. The nerve biopsy itself shows features that are more generic and that can be actually addressed by our standard morphology. Sani, you have other ideas? Yeah, but perhaps I can add uh, to what Sebastian just uh, explained is that, again, and also in line with Maria mentioned earlier about the uh, fragmented epilepsy surgery uh, specimen interpretations, it is perhaps also something where we as neuropathologists can bring it to attention of the neurologists to the clinical teams that there are certain uh, pathologies which we cannot diagnose uh, on, let's say, nerve biopsies as on this occasion. And genetic neuropathies are, broadly speaking, one of them. There are only a couple of genetic uh, neuropathies which have distinct pathologies where we can diagnose it on nerve biopsy. Vast majority would have non-specific changes. And even those which have distinct pathologies like focally folded myelin or uh, specific polyglucosan bodies, let's say nerve biopsy, even those, they can actually in much easier, much more efficient way, and even possibly even cheaper way that be diagnosed uh, on a blood test, on, on genetic screening. So that's perhaps something we also as neuropathologists can actually have that discussion with the clinical team and influence where instances where the nerve biopsy or brain biopsy or even muscle biopsy is not actually the, should not be actually the method of choice for establishing a diagnosis. So yeah, metachromatic leukodystrophy, nerve biopsy definitely would not be something we would receive uh, for, for diagnostic as a diagnostic uh, route. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think we're just about beginning to run out of time and I thought I would just wind this up because the, the, there's an interesting comment come in um, which says, might it be considered for the next iteration of Pathways to include authors outside Queen Street? Um, a, sorry, Queen Square. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure um, that will cause wry smiles. Um, the college, of course, is very keen to encourage a diverse and inclusive um, a group of people to write guidelines. One of the great difficulties we've got is people actually standing up and saying, please, can I be a guideline writer? Um, it is quite a lot of work, but very rewarding. And so my answer to the question is, we would be delighted if you wanted to put yourself forward um, to, to continue writing guidelines in neuropathology or indeed anything else for that matter. Um, and the college is uh, actively recruiting guideline authors. So please get in touch um, with us. And the details of that we will produce at the end. So thank you very much for that comment. And it gives us um, a, a very a useful in to, uh, to publicizing one of the directions of travel in the college, which as I say, is towards more inclusivity around the fellowship and membership. So thank you for that comment. Um, I think a lot, we, we've just got time for a last question, which has just come in, which is um, how often um, do we have meetings with clinicians about the availability and appropriate order of tests for genetic disorders? So are we meeting with clinicians to get the right, the, are they asking the right questions and have we got availability for the right genetic disorders? So I think we have to look at two distinct types of genetic tests. Here, I would like to focus on those which are underlying these degenerative diseases or uh, neuropathies, myopathies. Usually, it's the clinicians who have an idea of the test that they do. And nowadays, the majority of the tests are panels of markers, so panel sequencing, encompassing hundreds of, of genes and looking at uh, either next generation sequencing or whole genome sequencing. And that will then let them decide whether they actually need a biopsy. It is rarely the case that a neuropathologist has to advise on the genetic testing of a myopathy or a neuropathy or similar diseases. It is often quite the opposite, however, when we talk about the cancer pathways, where it is about advising oncologists and surgeons and uh, neuro-oncologists, neurosurgeons on the best molecular test for the brain tumor. But we are not discussing that in detail here. So this is actually a very different scenario. In that scenario of the brain tumors, it's often the pathologists who advise the clinical teams of the best process and test method. It's the opposite, I would say, um, with, with the, um, the kind of uh, tissues that come our way through the tissue pathways. Perhaps um, Zana and uh, Monica, Maria, have you got anything to add here? I, I guess I cannot add only that uh, when one writes the pathology report where the report was sent for question mark genetic neuropathy to be explicit in the comments about uh, possibilities, what can actually be diagnosed and what can't be diagnosed on the nerve biopsy hub. To what degree one can be specific uh, to answer that question. And then of course, unfortunately, it's, it's kind of a little bit too late for that specific patient where the biopsy was already done, but, but that is a good way how to start that conversation. And of course, then again, one can at times receive a phone call with, with a query whether, whether the nerve biopsy would be appropriate or muscle biopsy in that fact. And then again, that conversation would be, but it's not necessarily that yes, that we would have weekly meetings to uh, discuss what's appropriate and what's not in terms of the genetic disorders. Okay, thank uh, you. Monica, have you got to add anything? I I think with muscle biopsies, it can be a little bit of a mixture. It's true that increasingly genetics comes first for many things, for example, the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, but you can have situations where the pathology can be useful. So for example, in the congenital myopathies where there's certain structural abnormalities like nemaline rots or cores or central nuclei that can mm -hmm. point people in certain directions or with juvenile tightenopathies, there are certain features that people look for. Um, also, if a, if a, a mitotic dystrophy type 
type two is missed, there's a specific appearance on muscle histology that can be picked up. So it's a bit of a mixture, but increasingly genetics is becoming mm -hmm. important and done first. But we meet once every, if, if one does muscle biopsies, one meets on a regular basis which, with one's clinical team to discuss does those cases. I think that's standard practice. And perhaps and Maria, perhaps sorry, I can just on. quickly add one more thing, which is actually uh, not infrequent uh, in, in the matter of how frequent the genetic neuropathies are that increasingly, especially with these whole genome sequencing and so forth, there are variants identified which are of uncertain significance. And then actually muscle or nerve biopsy can be done to see whether there are changes in the nerve biopsy which could support the genetic finding of the variant which otherwise remains of uncertain significance. Maria, anything to add from the epilepsy side? You need to be unmuted. Sorry, not really. I, I think epilepsy for for now, the, the genetics is just coming into some of the lesions like cortical dysplasia. So it's likely to become a bigger part of the diagnostic um, sort of pathway in the future. But as we, as has been said, sometimes you find certain changes in the biopsy, such as vascular disease or, or even, you know, neurodegenerative, and you may trigger this genetics would be worthwhile. So sometimes we're seeing things they were unaware of aware of you know in the biopsies so mm. yeah well thank you all very much i think we've run out of time and it's time to bring the webinar to a close um but the whole idea is that this will be a resource um for our members to help support with the implementation of the guideline and um it, it would we hope it'll be a source of feedback to enable people to come back to the authors with notions as to how the guideline might be developed going forward. These are live documents and although we have iterations, the process is ongoing. And so it's important to have uh, people's views on how the, the guideline actually works in practice. So that's something for all of us. Um, again, a, if you are interested in guidelines, the specialty advisory committees are the ones who actually it help us with providing people for that, but you can circumvent that by getting in touch with the college directly if you want. Um, that's great. And finally, can I just thank all the participants, um, Zani, Maria, Monica, and particularly Sebastian, for putting so much effort into providing us with an excellent um, afternoon's uh, education.